Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. You know, I'm going to tell you, on today's Saturday special edition show, we're going to talk about something, the reasons why the government's going to move in the direction that they're going to move into and what's going to stimulate them into this direction. Let's get the chart started right here, and let's take a look at what's going on. First off, we're going to take a look back at what happened in the 1980s. Inflation started to run away with them, right? And it started to affect the U.S. dollar. It started to affect, affect everything. Well, what they did was is Paul Volcker, the Federal Reserve Chairman at the time, he raised interest rates up. And he actually raised them up to 20%. Can you absolutely imagine how high an interest rate that is of 20%? June 1981, they were they were able the federal funds rate was they rose it up as high as 20%. People that had money in the bank back in those days, you know, they, you could make a lot of interest on your money in the bank. In fact, you didn't need that much money in the bank in order to live off of your interest. Banks were paying a, a large interest on your interest bearing just your regular savings account even was paying tremendous amounts of interest it's like seven percent you know uh, just on a savings account you know and if you if you had wanted to put your money in, in a, into an account that was a little bit more risky well you could get you could get over ten percent interest rate I remember back then interest rates were so high but here's the thing Let's take a look at the U.S. National Debt Clock. Okay? Now, we're going to focus in here. It's going right now while we speak. It never stops. Day and night it goes. We're going to focus in on the U.S. National Debt, which is $22 trillion. And look at it climb. Look at it go. Every second we go by, it's climbing. But we're going to switch this down here, and we're going to take a look at the... Uh, give me a second with this chart. We're going to take a look at the U.S. unfunded liabilities. We're going to focus in on this unfunded liabilities. Now, the, this is the number right here, unfunded liability. As you can see, U.S. unfunded liability. Look at it climb just as we're... Well, a million. There's a million more. Oh, boy, guys. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, yeah, oh, no another million. Oh, uh, another million. Just every couple seconds, another million dollars is added to the U.S. unfunded liabilities. $123 trillion. This can never be paid off. But at this point, politicians, you still have politicians out there. Some of them are very conservative and they want to try to pay down the debt. Uh, they're in the mode of still cutting. Cutting as if it's really going to do anything to this U.S. unfunded liability cutting back on social programs they're still in this mood like like okay we can cure this we can cure this if we just do enough cuts to the economy if we just cut back in here cut back on a few social programs cut back on a few uh of spent expenditures uh don't build that wall it costs too much uh, blah 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 and they're in this still in this mood a little bit it's all going to change folks and i'm going to explain to you why the mood is going to shift and the reason why is, for some reason, it hasn't clued into them. You try to pay off the debt. You try to pay down everything. And what happens is you destroy the money. This is the way the system is set up. Debt is attached to each dollar. When they create a dollar, they do not create the money to pay the debt that's attached to the dollar. So if you try to pay off the debt, it extinguishes the dollars and ultimately puts the world into a deflationary spiral that you can't get out of unless you create inflation, unless you start to increase the money supply again, unless you start to uh, spend money. You have to spend money. And the system is set up so it's, it's set up as a Ponzi scheme. It has to continually grow or it dies. It has to continu continually grow or it shrinks back. Now, we're going to take a look at something else. I know I'm switching subjects on you guys a little bit, but we're going to take a look at this picture right here. This picture was from something... Now, historian buffs would know what this is. This is a picture of the French Revolution. 
that happened in France. Now, how this occurs is, is when more than 50% of the population gets into a state of being the have-nots and they don't have enough food to put food on the table, once you go over that number of 50% of the population, then this is what occurs. This is a natural process. This is what occurs. And once it occurs, it occurs swiftly, fast, unstoppable in, in its movement because of the dissatisfaction of the general a majority of the population. And basically, they do not, uh, when this occurs, here's another picture right here, it, it occurs so fast and it doesn't really have a, an actual uh, mind behind it as such. It's just, in general, the people are upset. Now, what does the government do when this situation happens? If they're able to maintain control. See, because most of the time, 99.999% of the time, the people do not realize that government is actually a servant to them. And the government doesn't realize this. They actually realize, they actually believe that, that the people have to do whatever they say and they're the lords. But the real truth of the matter is the government is supposed to be a public servant to the people. Don't realize this until it's an hour too late. You know? Now, as the numbers is 50% of the population. Uh, this is the USA uh, interest rates during the spike during Paul Volcker. And you see what's happened afterwards. The interest rates have come back down to, to zero. Well, this chart ended in 2010. Interest rates have popped back up. They're back up here around 2%. A little bit over 2%. The problem is, is this debt. This debt, the U.S. national debt, going back to the U.S. national debt, right here, and watching it grow, it has to be serviced. Now, if you try to normalize rates, if you even try to get the rates back up to around 4%, the United States will not be able to service this debt. So we can't, when inflation starts to run away this time, we can't manage it by raising interest rates like Paul Volcker did. We don't have that option anymore. Because of this U.S. national debt pile, this enormous debt pile is growing by the minute, it has to be serviced. And in fact, it's getting to the point now where, where they're not even going to be able to service it probably if the interest rates goes above 3%. And they're at 2 point something percent. So the Fed has got a block wall there. They cannot, at this point, take interest rates back up again to solve the inflation problems that are coming. So right now they don't have any. They only got very moderate and very small amount of inflation. And they actually, believe it or not, they want more inflation. So that they can continue to raise interest rates. But the problem is, is servicing this debt. They can't go too high with interest rates, so they're limited. Now, they can drop interest rates. They can even make them negative if they can only get rid of cash. Cash is a problem. And the reason why cash is a problem to them is because, quite simply put, if, as long as you can take your money out of the bank, why are you going to keep it in the bank if, if they go into negative rates, negative real rates? Because it means you're going to be paying a percentage to keep your money in the bank every year. Of course, people will start pull, pulling their money out of the bank. They'll start spending their money. But this is part of the idea. They want people to spend their money. But there's only one problem is they don't want you to pull your money out of the bank. So, if they can get rid of cash... This solves that problem, and then they can go into negative real rates without having bank runs. They can go deep into negative real rates. This helps to pay the debt. You see, what's happened is, in order for them to try to keep this global Ponzi scheme going a bit longer, 
They're having to do very strange things to the financial system, like negative real rates. ZERP, I think they call it. It goes beyond uh, zero interest rate policy. It's negative interest rate policy. It goes below the bar. and But the problem is going below the bar. Once they get more than 1% below the bar, when they start to go down 2%, 3%, then people start pulling their money out of the bank. So they got to get rid of cash. You see... What this reminds me of is it reminds me of a person that tells a little lie. They tell a little lie, not a big lie. But in order to support that lie that they just told, now they have to tell another lie. And the second lie is a little bit bigger than the first lie to support the theory that the first lie is correct. But then they have to tell a third lie because that second lie involves them telling the third lie. And then they keep building this tier of lies all to support that first lie and that's the way with this situation they've created this monster and now in order to keep it going a bit longer they have to keep doing more uh, more more things that are unusual within the financial system like controlling markets manipulating the price of gold and silver manipulating the oil price and yes they do manipulate the oil price uh, they had to bring the oil price down in order to support the dollar, just like they had to bring the gold and silver price down. And in fact, they brought the oil price down to $29 a barrel to support the dollar. It's all been about supporting the dollar. Why it's been about supporting the dollar is they have to keep the dollar strong in order to keep this system running. If the dollar gets too weak, well, then the system breaks apart. If the dollar gets too strong, the system breaks apart. What's happening is, is the Fed is being constricted. In order to keep this monetary policy going longer, in other words, kick the can down the road and keep this going longer, they keep having to restrict themselves in which to, what they can do. What the, and, and right now, they've narrowed themselves down to a tiny little range where they can barely move. Can't raise interest rates one quarter of a point at this point without setting the system ablaze. They cannot lower interest rates too much without messing the whole thing up. And so they've narrowed themselves down. They've painted themselves into a corner where there's not a whole lot that they can do at this point except one last thing, stimulate the economy. Now... The old sim stimulation of quantitative easing is not working like it did. The medication's not working. And remember I told you a minute ago how the United States population, if it goes over 50% of disgruntled? Well, right now, what is the disgruntled amount of people in the United States? It's running at 35% right now. So it's only 15% below that that line I told you about, that if it crosses. The government, they're feeling fairly cool right now. They're like, we're, we're cool guys. It's 35% of the population is disgruntled at us, but we're managing to hold this whole thing together and, and everything's fine. You know, I know it's 15 more percent and we'll be in huge trouble <laughs> because France right now, is getting up close to the 50% mark. And you see what's happening there? Emmanuel Macron, he's having a hard time. Okay, he's managing. But that's because they're not quite up to the 50% mark. They're getting close, so. Okay? And how how is, just exactly how is Emmanuel manage, managing, how is he managing through this the crisis that he's having right now in France? Well, he's given in to the people. He is trying to lower the taxes, and he's he's taken 11 billion euros, and he's going to subsidize things and everything. And in other words, he's given them money to pacify them. It's just like a baby who's in a crib, you know. Baby starts squealing, you know. And what does the mother come over and do? She gives the baby a pacifier, something to chew on, or she might you know, those little pacifiers they chew on, or, or she might give him a, a bottle with some milk in it. 
and then the baby starts to quiet back down again. Well, the public is the same way. When they start to get discontented, how do you pacify them? Well, we got 35% of the people in the United States who are discontented, roughly. Okay? How they're going to pacify them is very simple. Let's take a look at Alaska for a minute. Now, you might say, well, what are we looking at in Alaska here? Uh, we're looking at something called, go up here, it's called the Alaskan Permanent Fund. You know? And Alaska, for the last 40 years, has been given every person in the state of Alaska money. Now, here's the amount they give them. Back in 1982, they started it with an even $1,000 for every person in Alaska. Okay? But the next year, they dropped it down to $386. But then it slowly creeped back up again. And you see, in the 1990s, they were getting roughly $1,000 again. But then by the time it was into the 2000s, it started to go up. By 2007, it was $1,654 for every single person in Alaska. 2008, they got $2,069. For every single person in Alaska. Okay? And so this sort of a program, you know, you think to yourself, well, if they're getting all this money, what do they need to work for? They can quit work and just live off the money. Uh, but that's not what's happened. What's happened is the people continue to work and they enjoy this subsidy that they get every year and they use this money to help further the Alaskan economy. This money makes its way into the Alaskan economy. But it makes its way into the Alaskan economy in a much better way than, than, than the quantitative easing in the United States. The quantitative easing in the United States, it stays in the banking community. It stays on Wall Street. The banker bailouts stay within the banks. The money doesn't make its way. It doesn't filter its way down into the general economy. Whereas this Alaskan fund that goes to each and every person in Alaska makes its way directly in to the general economy. Okay? So now you're saying to yourself, well, this is something like a universal basic income. And yes, it is. And the people out there, they're not quitting their jobs just because they're getting an extra, well, what was it this year? An extra 1600 bucks. You know? So a husband and wife, you know, they might have their jobs. He gets 1600 She gets 1600 That's $3,200 coming into their household to help them with their expenses. It may be, maybe it pays their taxes or, or maybe it pays for new teeth or whatever, you know? And then it goes to the dentist. And the dentist, he spends it, he goes to Walmart, whatever. It makes its way directly into the general economy. Well, here's the thing. What we're talking about right now is a universal basic income. This is gonna be the next move by the governments to pacify the people because that number of 35% that's right now what do you think is going to happen when the next recession hits? Well, I can tell you right now, you can add 10% more disgruntled people at least, minimum, to the 35%. And that'll put us at 45%. You get to 45%, you're right where France is right now. And you see what's happening in France. Okay? So we, the next recession is going to create more disgruntled people. A lot more disgruntled people. And you're going to actually start to see the effects of this. Now, government's going to see the effects of this as well. I'm not going to list the effects for you, what happens when you get... But just look at France. Look at what's happening in France with a bunch of disgruntled people. Well, the United States is a bigger place. When the numbers get up to 45% in the United States, you're going to see similar to France, but that much bigger because the United States is bigger. So we see what's going to happen. As soon as that happens, the government is going to yield to them the same way Emmanuel Macron is right now yielding to the people of France. And the idea is already there. Universal basic income is the way the government's going to yield to them. So they're going to change their perspective because by that time, this U.S. national debt that we've been looking at will have racked up that much higher and there comes a certain point where the government just says, they look at the debt, and they look at it growing every minute, and they just basically, all of them agree, 
we need to pacify these people and the heck with the debt let it go as high as it wants we're already with step uh, and a certain a certain mind change mind change occurs within the government then at that point instead of scrimping and saying okay we're going to cut these programs and we're going to do this and we're going to do that which didn't work anyway it couldn't have possibly worked and the reason why it can't possibly work is the debt's way too high it's went way too out of control already well you just hit a certain point where a switch happens within all the government and they basically say okay we're not going to try to conserve anymore the hell with the debt let it go as high as it wants well, then they say to each other, well, how are we going to solve this problem? The debt's going to explode up. Well, I know. Let's lower, lower interest rates down to zero. And then we don't have to service the debt anymore. We can grow it as big as we want. There's no interest owed on it anymore. So we can make it any size we want it to be. We don't have, Because we were only paying the interest owed on the debt anyway. You know, and, and a change occurs. It becomes more important to them to satisfy the disgruntled people who are in the streets now at this point. It becomes more important than the national debt they're trying to conserve anymore. And then they switch. They go in the opposite direction. Then they want to try to spend as much as they can. And they don't care if the national debt goes to $22 trillion, $25 trillion, 50 trillion, 100 trillion, who cares? Let's go into these new programs. Universal basic income. So they offer it to all these disgruntled people across America. What happens? Cheers! Thank you, government. Thank you, government. Some of the women are down on their knees and they're, and they're kissing the ground. They're, they're, praise the Lord, you know? And we're going to get out of this poverty. Because the government now is going to all send us all a check every month. And it works. The government is, is now the friend of the people again. Okay? It's all part of the cycle that we're going through. This is all part of a cycle. And the government, these programs and things that I've been talking about and how poverty is going to swell across America due to this next financial crisis, this next... Uh, the recession that we're going, almost said depression, but this next recession that we're going to, we're heading into, and we're heading there fast. Most people are not aware of the English, or I should say, the United Kingdom, uh, in their their GDP is just barely above zero, and so is Germany. They're not realize they don't realize how in the next six months. This recession is going to get underway, and and the United Kingdom is going to fall into a recession, and so is Germany, and then that's going to start to extend out to other countries like like China is going to go into recession if they're not already in a recession. They're claiming to have over six percent GDP, but the Chinese numbers are all fudged. They're actually their growth is declining. They're actually starting to shrink back. The whole world's going to go into this recession. And the net result of this recession is going to be far more disgruntled people. We're going to see this spill over into government, and this is going to push the government. It's going to push them to either one of two things. They're going to have two options. Either they can take a hard line and have that number go over 50% of the people and have a, a general uh, revolution where the government then would have to answer because when once the revolution occurs then the people hold the government responsible and the people want to have uh what's the word i'm looking for a particular word when somebody wants to get not get even they want to uh when somebody wants to uh uh get uh, justice served you know uh, and and they take a hard line. Uh, this is how the, this is how they this is how they will be. Uh, but the ones that they will take and hold responsibility for the situation will be anybody that is 
that they can hold responsible. And we all know what happened in France way back a long time ago. Anyway, this just gives you an idea of what, and the government knows this. I mean, they know what I'm talking about right now. They know this, and they know the numbers. They know if it goes over 50% of the population, we got big problems. They got big problems. Actually, the people aren't going to have big problems. The government's going to have big problems. So they got that route. They can, they can go ahead and take a hard line, continue to try to cut back on this debt, you know, and cut, cut social programs and cut everything and try to and, and, and go into austerity and all this kind of stuff. They can go that route. But they're going to take responsibility for it, and they're not going to get any reward. Okay? Or they can go this other route. And this other route is just print more money. Make more money and give everybody money. Well, then they become the heroes. All the people out there, a lot of the dissatisfaction goes down immediately. Because this is what happened for Macron when he decided to give them money and he give them 11 billion more euros and cut taxes and stuff. We can see that the situation has settled down some. Now, if he had to give them a lot more, of course, he was constrained as to how much money he could give them right now. you know. But if he had to give them a lot more, well, then they would have hailed him as a hero. If he had to give everybody in France 100,000 euros... <laughs> right? They would have had him up on uh they would have they would have taken uh, Emmanuel Macron and put him up on a pedestal and put a wreath on his head and they all would have patted him on the back and kissed both of his cheeks and told him he was the most wonderful man on earth if he had just released the pocket strings to all the people. You know? But he was under constraints and what he was able to do was limited so even what he did settled settled it back a little bit. So which way do they want to go, the government? Do they want to go off in this direction where they take a hard line on the people and then the people revolt and then they're in huge trouble? Or do they want to go off this way, the easy way, where the people are going to be happy and everybody's happy? Of course, the U.S. debt will just bloat. But who cares at that point? Because they can't solve it now anyway. It's gone beyond the pale. Just basically the idea is let her go higher. So so this big question about universal basic income, the question is, who's going to pay for it? Well, the answer is the government. They're just going to rack it onto the debt. Once they, once they realize at a certain point that the debt's out of control anyway, just what's a couple more trillion between friends? When you already owe 22 trillion, let it be 24 trillion, and that'll pay for a year of universal basic income for all. But what's the other effect of universal? Well, they're worried that that the that the people will quit their jobs. Well, Alaska shows that that doesn't happen. They're especially not going to quit their jobs if you pay it to all. Pay it to all the people, even if they have a job. So then it would be more like a bonus every year. But there's another thing. They have to constrain it. They cannot give the people who are on universal basic income more than they're giving the working class people out there. Otherwise, the working class people would quit their jobs to get universal basic income. That's a constraint. And no matter how high the debt goes, that constraint will remain in place. Probably they can give, and, and there's another constraint. They also have to make it enough where these people can not starve. And, 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 and uh, also these people are going to say to themselves, hey, you know what, we've got enough money where we can feed ourselves now. But they can't give them enough money to make them rich. So there's a little narrow range there for the government of how much universal basic income they can give. And that range comes into about half the amount that the working class people are getting. So you can see this all filters down. It all keeps herding the government into this universal basic income. It's like they're going to be herded there in the next few years by the disgruntled people. And the universal basic income is only going to work to a certain extent 
it's actually going to create more poverty than it solves because they're not going to be able to give these people enough money to support a house. Otherwise, people would quit their jobs. So we can see what's coming. It's going to be like a welfare state where the government is using this welfare as a tool to pacify the people so that the people do not uh, go crazy. I'll just put the word go crazy, you know. And the people will be more on the government side. They just want to sway the people. They're going to use this as a tool to sway the people, to sway the numbers in their favor, to keep it from going over 35%, to keep the disgruntled people, the numbers of disgruntled people, under 35%, or try to. But the net effect of this universal basic income is, is the debt's going to run away on them, and inflation's going to start to run away on them. And now we're going to go back to the crux of the matter. Why they cannot stop this runaway inflation is they can't do what Paul Volcker did. They can't raise interest rates anymore because this debt, this enormous problem of this debt. So they're going to have to keep interest rates down low. And what's going to happen is inflation's going to start to heat up and run away. Now what happens to their universal basic income? Well, say they set the bar at a certain level. Let's just, for argument's sake, say they decide to give every person in the United States $1,000 universal basic income. Well, when they first give that universal basic income of $1,000, a lot of people right now that are getting way less than that on welfare or whatever will feel rich. And, of course, the working class people, they get an extra $1,000 a month on top of what they're already making. So they might be making, I don't know, I'm just going to guess, let's say a working class guy was, was making 2000 a month right now, and he gets an extra 1000 All of a sudden, he's got $3,000 a month, and he's able to spend it into the economy. The economy starts to actually pick up from all this new money out there. People are have money to spend. Inflation starts to heat up even hotter. What happens is, so after a few months goes by of this inflation, that thousand dollars that these disgruntled people are getting doesn't go anywhere. It goes about what five hundred would have been after a few months goes by, and a few months more months goes by, and it's cut in half again as to what it can purchase. So all of a sudden, all these disgruntled people out there who now have the universal basic income, the thousand that the government's given them is not enough. It's not enough to, to, to even buy their food with now at this point uh, because of inflation has chewed away its, its value. So the government says, well, we have an answer for this too. Instead of giving everybody in America a thousand, now this is about after it goes on for about six months or eight months into the program, they say, well, we have a solution. Instead of giving everybody in America for $1,000, now we're going to up it to $2,000. So, yeah, sure. When they first up it to $2,000, everybody's happy, and now they can go and buy their food again. It's enough. A few months more progresses. And it now the $2,000 isn't buying anything anymore. So then the government says, well, we got a new idea. We're going to give everybody in America $10,000 a month. And it just keeps going. It keeps snowballing more and more. And the inflation keeps snowballing faster and faster. And the government can't keep up. And in the end, we're in the hyperinflation. And the numbers that used to seem big, like $10,000 a month income, now... It doesn't seem big anymore. You go to the grocery store, you're absolutely shocked. You go to the grocery store and you find that the prices of meat now are the same prices that five years ago you used to be able to buy silver for. <laughs> you know? This is called hyperinflation. It's not a process that, that bang, it happens overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period of months. And actually, over a period of years, it's a slow process. But once it gets started, it's almost impossible to stop. And the end result is 
the dollar actually goes to being worth nothing. That's because it was really worth nothing all along. It was created from debt. It's a debt instrument. Thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys in the next show. Bye-bye, guys.